The scripture I want to look at with you now is one of the deepest encouragements to real, heartfelt, confident prayer. It's Romans 8, verses 14 and 15. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. We Christians, Paul writes, do not receive a spirit of slavery and fear. We do not receive a spirit of desperate insecurity before God. We've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Now, notice what Paul has done here in our passage. He writes the letter to the Romans in Greek, but here he's inserted this one Aramaic word, Abba. Why? Why this word in a different language all of a sudden? This one word in a different language? Well, you turn to the scene in Mark 14, where Jesus is praying in the garden the night before he's killed. And there, you hear him talking in private to his father and saying, Abba, Father. Paul is showing us as personally as he can that sonship, the sonship we are given, means being given the very relationship with the Father that Jesus himself has. We come before the Father now just as Jesus always has, just as Jesus does. Abba. This is Jesus' personal name for his Father, and he shares it with us. Dear brothers and sisters, this is what the gospel gives us. The Father doesn't merely make us servants. He doesn't simply declare that we are accepted as his citizens. No, the Son shares with us his own sonship, united to the Son, adopted in him, sharing his sonship. The children of God receive the very spirit of the Son, which is why he makes us cry the very cry of the Son, Abba. The eternally beloved Son comes to us to share with us the love the Father has always lavished on him. He comes to share with us bring us into the life that is his, that we might be brought before the Most High, and not just as forgiven sinners, as dearly beloved children, sharing by the Spirit the Son's own Abba cry. The Father's eternal love for his Son encompasses us. This is the good news that gives happy zeal to prayer. Think of the message of John's Gospel. It's throughout the Gospel. When the Word comes to us from God, becoming flesh, his light driving away the darkness, what salvation does he bring? John 1 verse 12. To all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The Word the Son is presented to us in John chapter 1, verse 18, as being eternally in the bosom or lap of the Father. And Jesus declares that his desire is that believers might be with him there. John 17, verse 24. And it's something modeled to us at the Last Supper. In John chapter 13, verse 23, we read, one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table close to Jesus, or, or more literally, reclining in the bosom of Jesus. Yes, Jesus has been eternally in the bosom of the Father, and John is now in the bosom of Jesus. Is why Jesus can say to the Father in John 17, verse 23, Father, you have loved them even as you have loved 
me. For he shares with us that intimate Abba cry. He gives us his own comforter, the Spirit, to be our comforter as well. Jesus shares with us all he has, his own life. The great Welsh preacher Martin Lloyd-Jones, when he was commenting on this passage in Romans 8, he put it like this. He said, The Apostle Paul's greatest concern is that we should know and realize that we are sons and daughters, children of God, that we should be rejoicing and praising God and crying, Abba, Father, that we should be delivered from the spirit of bondage. He said, Paul's desire for us is for us to be so sure of this that no matter what may come from the outside, we shall remain fully confident we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And so when a Christian prays deliberately, confidently, calling the Almighty Father, it shows they've grasped something beautiful and fundamental about who God is and to what they've been saved. Knowing God as our Father wonderfully gladdens our view of him. It gives the deepest comfort and joy. I think the honour of it is stupefying. Imagine, to be the child of some rich king would be nice, but to be the beloved of the emperor of the universe is beyond words. Clearly, the salvation of this God is better even than forgiveness, and certainly more secure. Other gods, maybe other gods would offer forgiveness, but this God, our God, the living God, welcomes and embraces us as his children, never to send us away. Because children do not get disowned for being naughty. He doesn't give us some kind of he loves me, he loves me not relationship, whereby I have to try and keep myself in his favour by behaving impeccably. No. To all who simply received him, to those who simply believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, John 1, verse 12. And so, with security to enjoy his love forever. Think, my brothers and sisters, think of just who the Son is. He is the one eternally, utterly loved by his Father. The Father would never moderate or renounce his love for the Son. And the Son comes to share that as the Father wanted. Because Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers, Hebrews 2.11, his Father is not ashamed to be known as ours, Hebrews 11.16. Nothing could give greater confidence and delight in approaching the heavenly throne of grace. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we, sinners, should be called children of God, and that is what we are. 1 John 3 verse 1. That is what we are. John Calvin said that Christ's aim in all that he did was so to restore us to God's grace as to make the children of men children of God, to make the heirs of Gehenna, of hell, heirs of the heavenly kingdom. That's the aim of his redemption. God's blessing is sonship, becoming a child of God. And so, you must know this, effort can have nothing to do with it. Your efforts can make you a slave, but no amount of effort can make you a son. All our efforts to win God's blessings by praying harder, by working harder, can only produce slaves, slaves who will not inherit, but sonship is free. 
And this is right at the heart of the Christian battle, knowing that the only blessing God has is completely free, free adoption for real failures. Because naturally, I go through life thinking, oh, I'm so inconstant, I'm so faithless, I'm so riddled with sin. My Christian life is so poor, and so I doubt that God can still love me. But thinking that is precisely why our Christian lives are so poor, because we've bought Satan's inversion of the gospel, that once I sort myself out, then God will love me. But what would any kind father think, hearing that from their child? The father Hearing that his child needs to earn his love? No. Oh no, our Heavenly Father thinks, my child, you start by knowing that I love you, that I've always loved you. And when you go off in sin, I still love you. And if you stop thinking about me, if you deliberately do what you know offends me, I will still love you, I will always love you, and nothing you do, nor sin, nor death can stop me, my beloved child. And knowing this is precisely what will make us wholehearted for the Lord and joyfully eager in prayer. If you want proof, come with me and have a look at the only Old Testament character who is repeatedly said to have followed the Lord fully or wholeheartedly. I wonder if you know who that is. Who is the only Old Testament character who's said to follow the Lord wholeheartedly? It's Caleb. And Caleb is a fascinating character. Come to Numbers 13 and the list of the Israelite spies sent out to spy out Canaan. Numbers 13, verse 4. And these were their names. From the tribe of Reuben, Shamua, the son of Zakur. From the tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, the son of Hori. And here we go. From the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. So, what do we know of Caleb? Caleb is of the tribe of Judah, right? But who's Jephunneh? his father. Turn with me to Numbers 32. Numbers 32, verse 12, we read, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite. Now, the Kenizzites were pagan Canaanites. Do you remember Abraham was told back in Genesis 15, the Lord will give to his descendants Canaan, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and all that lot. So, do you see, Jephana is a Kenizzite. Caleb's father is a pagan Gentile. Caleb is an ethnic Gentile who's joined Israel. And that explains his name. The Israelites always thought of foreigners as Gentile dogs. And Caleb means dog. And presumably he kept the name as a badge of honour, as it still is today for those who wear it. Yes, he was by birth a dog. But he'd been adopted into the tribe of Judah. In Caleb, a Gentile dog became a son of the royal tribe of Judah. Now, is it a coincidence that Caleb was so repeatedly spoken of as wholehearted for the Lord? No. Welcomed and embraced, he was far less likely to fall into Baal worship. Undeterred by the mighty Anakim of the land, he drove them out and he was a hardy soldier of the Lord into his late 80s. For he was adopted and he belonged with the Lord and his people. My dear friends, praying when you know 
the Almighty One is your Father, changes everything. It means he knows we're weak. He knows we struggle to pray. He knows we often don't know what to pray, which means we don't need to pretend to be giants in prayer. We can simply stammer out what's on our hearts. So if you are struggling to pray, just stammer like a child to a father. Cry for help. Don't try to be impressive. Go with the boldness of a beloved child to a kind father and plead the friendliness of God. Do you remember how Jesus said to his disciples? He said in Luke 11, from verse 5, suppose one of you has a friend and he goes to him at midnight and says, friend. You see, Jesus is saying that praying is enjoying the friendship of God. Our Father wants fellowship with us. And he's such a kind Father. Jesus actually encourages us. He, this is extraordinary. He encourages us to be impudent in prayer. He says of the friend in Luke 11, because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. The Lord wants us to dare prove his overwhelming generosity. God likes it. He likes boldness, nerve, shamelessness in prayer. There's something similar going on in Isaiah 49. From verse 15, do you remember the Lord says, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she's born? Even though she may forget, I will not forget you for see, I've engraved you on the palms of my hands. Jesus is strong that the willing and attentive kindness of our Father is essential to know for prayer. You see, we instinctively think of God without Christ. We think of God merely as Lord and Judge. And when we do that, we'll feel, well, he won't want to hear from us sinners. And we won't, in our guilt, want to be in his presence. But when we remember his friendliness, his open-armed fatherliness, that he's adopted us, it makes us want to go to him. So my dear brothers and sisters, as you pray, hold clearly before your eyes the fatherliness of God. You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. You have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father.